Welcome to Women in the Word, and I wanted to um, introduce myself for some of you that might not know me. My name is Brenda. I'm Pastor Ted's wife. Um, he is the lead pastor of Reliance Church, and so uh, we, we welcome you, and we pray that this season of Bible study is just one that would be a blessing um, for all. So normally we have a little more time for teaching, so as Ted would say, I'm going to feed you with a fire hose um, today. <laughs> He's a fireman, so we get a lot of fireman analogies when, um, when he speaks. But um, the key verse in Joshua is found in Joshua 1.8. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 1. The key verse found in verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And what a great key verse for us as we come and as we study. And I cannot tell you, I picked this book before our transition, before we knew what God was going to do. And if you've sat with it and you've done your homework, you're blown. I'm blown away that this is what we're studying right now as we have the two churches coming and becoming one family. What an amazing thing to sit at his feet and learn. So I'm going to give you some background information. From Exodus 3 to Deuteronomy 34, the focus is primarily on Moses and him leading the children in, of Israel in the desert. And now we have a new leader, and his name is Joshua, and we're coming into where God's going to start giving him the direction for those children. The book of Joshua is historical for sure, and we're going to learn a lot of history about what they went through and about their travels and journeys. But also, we can take from that. We can learn so many lessons through their shortcomings, through their mistakes, through their triumphs, through their victories. Um, it all applies to our life in, in so many ways. A little about Joshua he is described as a slave, he's described as a soldier, he's described as a, ser a servant, he's described as a spy. And he's also described as a successor. And that's what we're going to see as we un unfold this first chapter of Joshua, that he is the successor for Moses, who couldn't take the um, children into the promised land. Joshua died when he was about 110. That puts him probably at about 85 or so when he took over the leadership here. I know. So for those of you in my club that are seasoned saints, um, there's still work to do. There's a lot of younger people in this, um, in this congregation, in this nation, who need us older, more experienced saints to come along and pour into them. And I can't tell you, I think more so in history, in any other time in the world, if people need to know the word of God, it's now. I mean, we need to understand the word, we need to know what it says, and we need to be able to pour out into a word. And it has to start in the church, because the church is getting weak. The church is getting weak in its knees, and we need to strengthen the body, not only here locally, but then everybody doing their part in other places, we can strengthen the Christian body at large. Um, Joshua was probably about 5 to 10 years old when Moses killed, uh, killed the Egyptian. Um, he would have grown up in the time of the slavery under the taskmasters in Egypt. He would have been a little boy. And um, he would have been one of the ones, the family, crying out to the Lord, please deliver us. So he would have been there. He came, um, he along with Caleb were one of the uh, two spies that went out to the land, and they're the only two in that generation that got to enter into the promised land. Everybody else perished in the desert, in the wilderness. I mean, that there's a whole lesson just in that. Could you just sit with all these themes for like, I mean, we could have done a six-week study just on chapter one. Like, there's so many themes within it. Um, Joshua is mentioned for the first time in Exodus chapter 17, and there he begins his training without even knowing it. He became Moses' assistant, not knowing what God was going to call him to do. And that just reminds me of not despising the small days that God gives you because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring next month, next year. You don't know what he's going to call you to do. And you can't learn to lead until you become a good follower. Um, it's really difficult to lead if you can't follow somebody. We have to follow the Lord first and foremost. 
And as a future leader, a future leader's faithful in small and significant ways. You know, if you see, I mean, you hear about, you know, people being at, at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and I'm sure everybody's seen it in their own lives, you know, a pastor who serves, a leader who serves, and you understand they're going to serve whether they're in the nursery, whether they're picking up trash, it's all for the glory of God. God places people in his body where he sees fit. Deuteronomy 31, the Lord gives the commission to Joshua, but he has to wait on the Lord. He had already, God had already put on his heart what he was about to do. God had commissioned him, but the timing was in essence, wasn't it? it, it he had to wait on that timing. And sometimes God puts things on our heart and we want to jump ahead of God. And God's like, wait, wait for my timing. It's not time yet. Now starting chapter 1, we reach the border of the promised land where God is about to give Joshua his orders. And for time's sake, I'm going to summarize chapter uh, 1 for you. Um, you've, I'm sure you've all read chapter 1. And so I'm going to kind of summarize it and then pull out a couple of highlights and then you'll go into your groups and kind of dig in just a little bit more. Um, after the death of Moses, God speaks to Joshua that it's time. It's time for him to take his people across the Jordan and into the land which he's given them. Wearsby says this. He says, there comes a time in every ministry when God calls for a new beginning, a new generation, a new leadership. It was God who chose Joshua, and everyone in Israel knew that he was their new leader. God had gone before him. God had set it up. God had put in the people's hearts that this is the work that he was going to do, and he was going to do it through Joshua, and they got on board. You know, Now, probably not all of them got on board because some of them were left in the wilderness, and if you've studied Exodus, you know that not everyone learned their lesson in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, They were still stubborn and, and hard-headed, and we can be like that too in our wilderness experiences. So he tells them that he's going to um, give him this. He says, anywhere your foot goes, that's going to be your land. He lays out very specific boundaries. And we see that they didn't take all the land that they were supposed to take, right? He didn't, because I was, I was asking Ted, well, where's the Euphrates? And it's like, oh, it's way over here. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Israel's way down here. And so you see they didn't take all that God had for them. And we'll talk about that also in a minute. God tells Joshua that nobody will stand against him, and he will never leave him or forsake him. Isn't that good news? Just knowing that God will never leave me. He will never forsake me. It reminds me of Romans 8.31. If God can be for us, what? Who can be against us? God is for us. We meditate on his word. We stay in it. We stay close to him. We stay related to him, and then he never leaves us or forsakes us. Even when we walk away, as the example in the prodigal son, he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. We're sealed for eternity if we belong to him. He charges him to be strong and courageous because he's the leader and he's going to need it. But is he going to need his own strength? No, he's going to need the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ because without that, without the confidence in God, he doesn't stand a chance. And there's no room for, for the flesh for him. And so he reminds him several times, be strong, be courageous. He tells him that prosperity and success will be found in obedience. Have you found that in your life? Prosperity and success comes through our obedience to God. Now, we're not talking about that I'm, if I'm obedient to God, now I'm going to get a Mercedes Benz. And I just need to name it and claim it. That's not the kind of prosperity we're talking about, right? But it's the prosperity and the success that if we're in Christ, then anything that we go through, he's with us. I can have my prosperity and my success in him because he's going to take me through whatever he brings my way. That's the kind of confidence that he's talking about. Joshua tells the officers to get the people ready for the journey, and they take three days to get it ready, which is significant and he summons the tribes to help them get there so they say that they will um, do all that Joshua commands which confirms the calling on his life because they're like I see what God's doing I'm here Joshua and I'm going to follow you so he sees that come through and then they tell him um, he just they just ask him only have the Lord with you and be strong and courageous I don't know about you but as a wife when my husband wants to go and do something, I just want to know, 
that the Lord is with you. I want to know, don't you? Like when your husband makes a decision, it's like, okay, I need to know that it's only the Lord that's with you, that you're going to be strong and courageous, not in your own strength, but in the Lord's strength. And then I always tell Ted, my trailer's hitched to you. I'll go wherever you go, but please look me in the eye and tell me it's from the Lord. That I mean, don't you all agree? That's what you want from your husband. So a couple of um, highlights before we get into our group time. Um, this is such a beautiful picture of Jesus, a type of Jesus. And everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything points to a New Testament. And this narrative is beautiful. We know the name Joshua, Yahshua is Jehovah, is salvation, delivering the people into the promised land. Um, something Moses couldn't do. And the typology is good for us to know because Moses, who represents the law, can't save us. And so he wasn't able to take the people into the promised land because we can't have an eternal security in Christ by the law alone. We must have the, the work on the cross that Jesus Christ died for us, that he sacrificed his life, that he poured out his blood on our behalf. And then once we have that, that's what saves us. It's by grace that we are saved. And not of anything that we do, lest any one of us can boast, but it's the gift of God. It's a free gift that he gives us in, in a gift of eternal security, a gift of eternal life based on what he did. Do we deserve it? No. Can we earn it? No. It's just something that he allows us through belief and faith in him. And what a, an awesome picture this is of that. Um, this was a time of big changes for them all, wasn't it? They had been in the wilderness for a very long time. So this meant a lot of change for these um, children of Israel. No more manna, no more pillar of fire by night, no more cloud by day, no more Moses, no more of their leader, no more living in tents. Now you, you might think at first glance like, well, that sounds glorious. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big tent camper. Like, I, I don't really like the dirt. I used to like the dirt when my kids were littler, but now that I'm a little older, like, you know, I don't know. Does anybody like to tent camp? <laughs> oh, I see a group forming. <laughs> the tenters. <laughs> um, I'm not a big fan, and I would think that they were celebrating, but here's the thing. Don't we just get familiar in our own circumstances? Even sometimes something that's bad, like, We'll stay in that place because we don't want the change that's necessary to get to the promised land. And so familiarity sometimes is really comfortable, but sometimes that familiarity puts us right into the pit or right into a rut, and we can't get out of it. And sometimes, um, I don't know about you, but I can identify this. You want to change a behavior. You want to change something in your life, but then the work that's required or saying goodbye to something that you like is required, and then that's when we have a hard time, and that's when we become disobedient. Um, the wilderness is never God's permanent destination for his saints. He never wants us to stay in the wilderness. Disobedience and sin kept the Israelites in the wilderness, and it's what keeps us there too. That's not where God wants us to dwell. It's not his dwelling place for us. Yes, lessons are learned, but... That's not what he wants. Obedience brings Christ's victory to us. And not that everything's going to be rosy. We know that this world comes with trials and tribulation. God said it would. They were even going to Canaan, and Canaan wasn't, wasn't related to heaven. Heaven is heaven. We're, we're foreigners passing through. So in this life, we're going to have troubles. We're going to have trial. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have sufferings. It just comes with being in this world, but thank God we are not from this world. We're just passing through to our final destination, which is with Jesus in heaven. And sometimes I'll tell people in counseling, it's like, you know, and I, I'll speak to myself, you know, I want to get here, but sometimes I'll just have to say, but you're not going to get there from here. You know, you're not going to get there from here. I'll even tell that to my kids in raising their children. I have six grandchildren, and my kids will they'll want the behavior to be this, and it's like, you're not going to get there from here. You know, so we got to find out, if we want to get here, 
how am I going to get there? What kind of right decisions do I need to make? What kind of changes do I need to make? I mean, really taking a self-evaluation on what we need to do. Um, questions to think about, especially in the wilderness, and if you want to write some of these down, what's my destination? Like, where do I want to be? What's my destination, like, spiritually speaking? Not like, where do I want to live? Or do I want to go to Disneyland this year? No, like, spiritually speaking, what, what do I want to be? Are you taking steps to get there? Are you going in the right direction? You know, a lot of times we, we think we're going one way, but our course is a little off, and then that takes us way far away. God said the road is narrow, but the, the wide gate leads to destruction. Do you allow leadership in your life? Do you allow people to speak into your life? How do you handle a rebuke if someone rebukes you? Do you receive it? Do you ask God what the truth is in it? Or do you turn it off? Do you allow leadership in your life? The wilderness represents a barren spiritual life of unbelief, rebellion, fear, complaining, disobedience, and sin. And obedience in Christ brings victory. I remember having a, a type of wilderness experience in my life. And the only way that I could think to describe it, I was a mom with three little kids and I was just done. Anybody ever been there? Just, you're just done. You, I mean, you can't even pick up the Bible because you are so like in that wilderness. And it was just hard to even read a sentence, let alone dig into a study. And the only way I could describe it is that I, I would tell Ted, I feel like I've jumped into a swimming pool, but there's no water in it. <laughs> I just like hit the bottom of it. And I remember having to go to counsel and get good godly counsel of how to get out of that wilderness that I was in. God has a promised land. You know, many, many people spend their entire life wandering around in the wilderness when we don't have to. God's given us everything that we need to be able to follow him. He gives us the antidote of, of wandering, and where is it found? In God's word. It's found in God's word. It must be on our lips, it must be in our minds, and we must observe it and do it. Everything that we need is in his word. We are to meditate on it. We are to speak about it. We are to act on it. The word of God gives us everything. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Joshua's secret to success was his faith in God's word. And we need to follow that example. Our faith needs to be in God's word. We need to let it cleanse us. We need to let it correct us. We need to let it refresh us. I would imagine they learned a few things in the desert experience, don't you? Not all of them, apparently. I remember going through Exodus and thinking, when are these people going to learn? <laughs> like, they do a lot of things. But I bet you they learned about contentment in the wilderness, having to be wandering around. I bet you some of them learned about patience and servanthood and long-suffering. Unity, definitely, trying to move that many people in one direction. They had to have some type of unity, humility. Um, man, and you know how you are when things are going good, and you're just like, praising the Lord, and praising the Lord, and then something happens, you're like, okay, Lord, what do you need to teach me? <laughs> like, what do I need to learn? Let me learn it quick, you know, because we don't want to be in that place where, like, but don't we forget sometimes when things are going good? We forget the Lord. We're just like kind of cruising along. We have to constantly be in his word. They were to enter, they were to conquer, and they were to occupy the land that God gave them. And like we said, they didn't possess all the land, and it was tragic that they didn't continue to go where God said, every place your soul hits this ground, you're going to be able to take that land. And they stopped short. And I, I kind of wondered why. Why would they stop short? You guys might have some great insight as to what you would think. And I was thinking, um, what would make them do that? Was it the fact that they were disobedient? Was it the fact that they were content? Like, well, we have this land. We don't need anything else. Was it that they were rebellious or that they were complaining or that they were in fear? I don't know. It might have just been like, this is good enough. You know, we get that attitude sometimes, like, well, I go to church enough. I read my Bible enough. I do this enough. 
Like, it, it's just, it's, you know, we're, I'm good. This is enough. And I think, what are we missing out on that God has for us? Ephesians 1, 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So why is it that we don't take what he's given us? Why is it that we can't grasp onto all the blessings that he has for us? Um, C.H. Spurgeon puts it this way. He says, Joshua was not to use the promise as a couch upon which his indolence might luxuriate. My translation, couch potato. <laughs> but to girdle, to gird up for future activity, we're not to just be lazy with the things of God. It's not just about taking in and taking in and taking in, and then we just go spiritually sit on the couch. It's about giving out and giving out and doing the work of Christ. There are people in our nation, in our world, all over the place, destined to be separated from God for eternity. And that has to wake us up in the morning. Never, I, I, I say again, never a time in history more do we need to be proclaiming God's word. And I read something this week that was fascinating. Do you remember the, the old saying about, um, you know, uh, live the gospel and if, if you need to, use words? And I heard someone say, that's like saying, feed the homeless without food. Like, we can't do that. We have to proclaim the gospel. That's what changes people's eternal destinations. We can be friends with someone forever, but if we don't at some point share the gospel with people, I mean, yeah, they might see, see it in our lives, but there has to be proclamation of God's word. Where are you today? Are you still, some of us, you know, we may find ourselves still in Egypt, like we're in bondage to something or someone and maybe we're looking back to Egypt, longing for those days gone by. You know, some of us, we tend to look back. Are we in the wilderness, roaming around and wanting victory, but not quite sure how to get it? Or are we in sin of disobedience, just keeping us there? And there's a way out, but we're not taking it. We're not looking for it. We're not obeying. Or are we just fully living in the promised land? We're doing our best to walk in the Lord, to read his word, and, and it's just our time. God's going to call us home someday, and we're going to get to enter the promised land. And I want to leave you with this. He says often, be strong and courageous and confident in God. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we would not have self-confidence, that we would have no room for the flesh, that we would be confident. We can be confident. And, um, and as you guys are thinking through this, and I've thought this, you know, sometimes you're scared to use your spiritual gifts because you're not confident in yourself or your own ability. We don't need, forget that. We do not need to be confident in our own selves to use our spiritual gifts. We're called to use them, and we're called to use them in God's confidence. So God offers this promised land. And so I, my hope through this series is that we would be able to possess it.